You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, welcome to another awesome episode of Ask Drone You. My name is Paul and today I have the pleasure of being with Mr. Bill English from the NTSB. Thank you for coming to the show. Hey, happy to have you, Paul. Uh, welcome to the NTSB Training Center. Yeah, this is gorgeous. In fact, we're out here in the boneyard where we get to see a lot of plane mid-air collisions right here. We get to see the remnants of them. It's very cool. But today we're talking about a recent helicopter crash that also involved a drone. And as the lead investigator of UAS, you, you took on this case, right? That's right. So we had a collision between an Army, U.S. Army Black Hawk uh, UH-60 helicopter and a Phantom IV uh, just south of New York City off of a small uh, Hoffman Island, it's called, just near Staten Island. Uh, back in September 21st, that happened. Um, so basically what happened there, the Army reported to us they thought they had collided with a drone. Uh, a few hours uh, into the next morning, a piece of the drone was actually found on the helicopter in the oil cooler, a motor and a little bit of the arm in there that was easily identified as a Phantom 4. So we knew we had what was now the first collision with what you might call a modern drone. Yeah, confirmed. it's a kind of a big deal that this has now actually happened. I mean, we haven't really had the data yet to, to showcase what would happen with a drone collision, really, with a helicopter. But I mean, so tell us about the, the flight path. I mean, this pilot, was he following the rules as according to 336 or 107, or was he outside of the boundaries? So the pilot was flying recreationally. Um, he didn't have a 107 certificate or anything like that, or a manned pilot certificate. He was actually flying from the east side of this area of water and you can see a map in our in our report maybe you can put that up on show notes mm -hmm. um, taking off from a beach in uh, the Brooklyn area of New York City and flying is around dusk and he flew towards this uh, little island which was two and a half miles away from where he took off from and by his own admission he was not within line of sight I don't I don't think <laughs> two miles that's pretty Yeager far. <laughs> probably couldn't see a phantom at two and a half miles so um, so flew definitely beyond line of sight um, and the helicopter was doing some maneuvering in the area. There were TFRs in effect at the time for the United Nations General Assembly and a presidential movement. So the helicopters were flying in support of that. And the TFRs, as most of them do, um, prohibit any unmanned aircraft or model aircraft activity in that area. And this was covered by that. So uh, by his own admission, he was beyond line of sight. And he really didn't know anything about the TFRs at all. Wow. Yeah, that's unfortunate that he didn't know. But I also read in the report that you guys may be recommending that there be some more um, immediate essential information over the DJI Go 4 app so people have no excuse to say, oh, I had no idea there was a TFR in place and I'm not supposed to fly and I don't know what that means. Well, what we found during the investigation there, Paul, was this pilot, he just didn't do anything other than just look at the app. That was the sum total of his training and, and his research. Um, and there is that TFR function in the DJI Go app. What we found through the investigation is at the time of the collision, that function had been tied off. It was having some problems, and it is advisory anyway. It's mm -hmm. not anything that is there certified to the level that you should be relying on. It's, it's there to help, but is just advisory. Um, so at the time, that was turned off. But this pilot didn't know even to look, even to look at the official FAA sources, things like there is the NOTAMS FAA website, which would be the official source, and plenty of other resources that you can use to find out, especially in a place like New York City. Yeah, yeah. it's a big, uh, huge area to fly. But in addition, so he, w he was flying beyond visual line of sight. Um, what about his altitude? I mean, did he even know that he had hit a plane? I mean, because I believe in the report it said that this guy had no idea he had hit a plane, he was missing a drone, and I'm sure that phone call to him that day was pretty entertaining for you at least. Well, that's yeah, that's how it, it kind of went down. He was flying the collision flight, he was flying at about 300 feet, right? Which to him, he said, well, I'm below 400 feet, it should be okay. But of course, helicopters can pretty much fly at any altitude, mm -hmm. military or civil. This, uh, you know, this was a military helicopter, there was the TFR. But really, on any day of the week, if there's no TFR, civilian helicopters could be there too. So um, what we did is track down the, uh, the operator through uh, manufacturing serial numbers on the aircraft itself. And we contacted him. And I asked him his name. I said, you fly a drone? He said, yeah. I said, you fly a phantom drone? Were you flying Thursday night? And he said, yes. I said, did it come back? 
And <laughs> Funny said, thing, well, no, no, it didn't. <laughs> it, it didn't. He said, did you find it? I said, well, yeah, we did find at least a part of your drone. And he said, where did you find it? I said, well, lodged in an army helicopter. And his response was, well, how did it get there? And of course, I said, well, that's what I want to know. <laughs> and he did not know that the collision even had occurred. He hadn't seen it in the news or anything like that. He just thought it had a failure and crashed into the water. So we said, well, we'd like to talk to you about this and bring your tablet and go from there. That's awesome. So at least he was cooperative. Yes, he was. Yeah. That, that's good. That's good. I'm sure, though, the call for him was rather scary because the NTSB and federal government saying, hey, noticed you uh, did something you weren't supposed to do. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I can't imagine how he was feeling, but it's really interesting because this uh, being the first time that a UAV has hit a helicopter, it was an army helicopter. I mean, do you think the damage could have been worse if it was, say, a civilian helicopter? I really can't say one way or the other. Um, I mean, it was certainly, you know, significant, you know, inch and a half wet dent in the leading edge of that road or some other, um, some other damage to it. Nothing went through the engine that we know. So could there be more damage on that helicopter or any helicopter? Possibly. But I think really the bottom line is, regardless of the level of damage, we don't want aircraft crashing into each other in True. the air. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really big point. Now, one question that a lot of people have been asking, Bill, is they're wondering essentially how you got the information on the pilot. So you said you had the serial number on the engine itself. You went to DJI, but I'm sure there was some sort of subpoena process or whatnot to get that information because DJI, it seems, wouldn't just be like, oh, well, here's all your information, here's all your data. So how did that, how did that happen? Right, well, this, this accident, just like any other regular aircraft accident, we run under the party system. So DJI was party to our investigation. That means that there's a free and open exchange of all the factual data, and DJI participated in that. And then to get the information about this person who's not part of DJI, we went through a very routine legal process they knew that they could provide the sales, you know, once we could figure out the build records of the aircraft, they had sales records. So we went through a very routine process and they provided the, uh, the sales records of the, uh, the owner with some contact information. And, and that's how you got them. Yeah, yeah. Just, this was very, very normal accident investigation procedures. Awesome. Yeah. So one other question, what ends up happening to this pilot? I mean, he, bra he breaks TFR, flying beyond visual line of sight, one of the busiest airspaces in the country. What's going to end up happening to him? So. The NTSB is purely a safety investigation agency. What we do is we do these investigations to bring out what are the safety issues and publicize those, make recommendations if we can to prevent reoccurrence. So we want to bring out to people the importance of why visual line of sight is so important. Something like this can happen. Mm -hmm. The importance of your ability to check for TFRs. You know, make sure you're looking at all the good official sources. That's our role. The FAA has the enforcement role, and if any enforcement action is taken, that would be in their court. So I don't want to speak for them. And same with law enforcement. So FBI or NYPD, they've got their own procedures they'll follow that's separate from us. And again, I'd have, I wouldn't want to speak for them. Gotcha. No, I think that makes sense. But overall, I mean, the message is definitely that we don't want to see mid-air collisions because as a whole, that's going to hurt the entire drone industry. You know, the more that this happens, I would essentially see some sort of um, influx of regulations and rules, even like what we're seeing today, but even more so. So I think the general idea here, guys, is that we really don't want mid-air collisions. And being informed and being notified of what's going on is just so important. But what I really appreciate that you said is that, you know, these advisory types systems that are in DJI go for. I mean, we've known there to be issues with other companies like, you know, AirMap providing data and, and there's been some um, glitches, we'll call it, in the data that's themselves. So I like the fact, too, that you're saying just go to the source, you know, whether it's NOTAMS or, you know, what is it, 1-800-WX-BRIEF. It's a great source as well. And it's an official source. And guys, you also cover your ass when you go to these sources because if you call into the official line it's recorded i believe is that correct yeah the 1-800 wx brief is recorded yep. so you would have a way to say well i did do my uh my due diligence before i flew so all in all what would you say the the final i mean if if you had a word out to all the pilots what would you tell them about this investigation and what do you think the message here is well, probably the bottom line with this is we've got some rules out there i mean it's simple stuff right maintaining visual line of sight and it's pretty easy. You can go on YouTube and you can see some people going way beyond line of sight. There's a reason that rule is in it. You may not like it. You may think it's silly, but this shows us there's a reason for this. Mm -hmm. and bad things can actually happen. So, you know, check in that airspace. Stay in, in line of sight. Um, if you're going to fly in different conditions, you know, this was dusk near nighttime. The rules are there for a reason. They really are. Um, that's to help you stay safe. Other people in the airspace stay safe. People on the ground, they are there for a reason. And like you say, that if we have more events like this, that's only going to hurt 
everybody. Yeah, even you guys who use drones for a accident investigation, is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, we're an operator as well. We use uh, just over there is our little fleet of drones. We uh, map accident sites for aviation, rail, and everything with that uh, on a routine basis. Yeah, that's awesome. In fact, um, if you guys missed it at the DJI Airworks conference, Bill was giving a presentation about exactly how they use drones and mapping to essentially, or I should say modeling, to essentially reconstruct accident scenes to make better decisions. And what I love is that you said, you know, we have this new this new exercise, this new um, standard operating procedure to do this because it speeds everything up. That's right. Yeah, and that, that's truly awesome. I mean, I think it's really cool. Are you guys using them for anything else? Uh, that's all we do is accident investigation. <laughs> so. but, I mean, uh, in accident investigation, we've done wreckage searches, modeling, mapping. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a great tool for us to get them done more efficiently, more accurately, and more quickly. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Bill, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Appreciate and it, guys, man. that's going to do it for us today. Remember, before you go out and fly, make sure to follow the rules. Otherwise, it's going to hurt all of us as a whole. That's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul, and you're listening to Ask Drone You. <laughs>